Awesome. All righty, guys. Thank y'all for joining and tuning in today to our Trainer Tip Tuesday, our first one here on Facebook Live. I'm Amy, founder of the Dog Guide San Antonio, and I'm here with our guest today, Stephanie Garza of Pup, Pup, and Away. She is a certified dog trainer and runs Pup, 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 Pup and Away, an awesome business uh, for dog owners here in San Antonio. Um, before I get started, Stephanie, can you tell us a little bit about how long you have been working with dogs and training dogs and how old Pup Pup and Away is. Yeah, so super quick synopsis of my dog life. Um, I started working in like the vet care industry in 20, 2007 when I was a senior in high school um, and just had a couple of different jobs throughout all of that. Uh, life took me to Houston in 2012 and I started doing um, some training over there, became a certified dog trainer um, with the Certification Council of Professional Dog Trainers. And uh, life brought me back home to San Antonio where I started to do, um, I opened up Pup Pup and Away in 2016 um, doing dog walking, pet sitting, and then, you know, my, me just doing some private one-on-one -on -one lessons with clients. And then last year, January 2020, we opened up our facility. So now we have uh, boarding and daycare and a bunch of different training options for everybody. Awesome. I'm excited to have you join us. Um, I also forgot to mention that Stephanie has been a longtime contributor to the Dog Guide essay website, and we're super grateful to have her as part of the team, providing her insights as a dog trainer. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, today's theme is how to get your dog to stop barking. Um, I know a lot of people have sent us questions or you know expressed interest in learning more about this. Um, I know my dog, Terry, whom you've met and we've worked together with before, um, she's a Chihuahua Min Pen mix. And uh, the Chihuahua part definitely means she can be very yappy at times. So um, we'd love to talk about ways we can help our dogs not bark when we don't want them to. So, um, I'll, I'll lead some questions and bring some reader questions in. But before we talk about uh, those questions, can you let us know what are some of the reasons why dogs bark and what why it's important to know why they're barking? Yeah, there's... I, I get this question a lot, like, how can I get my dog to stop barking? And the reason is it's not as simple as that um, because there's so many different reasons for which our dogs bark. Mm -hmm. um, and it really kind of depends on the situation. Um, and it's ever changing. You know, one, one situation, your dog might be barking for one specific reason. In a different situation, the, the reason might change. So how you approach your training is going to depend on that. Um, it also depends a little bit, kind of like what you said about Terry. You know, she has a, she's a chihuahua, so she's bred to be a little bit yappy. Um, mm -hmm. I have schnauzers, also bred to be a little bit yappy. So <laughs> we have, uh, you know, breed temperaments. Um, some dogs are more um, d destined to be barkers. Some of them are not. Um, it really kind of just depends on the breed. Um, but speaking from a behavioral standpoint, um, there's lots of different reasons. Um, the biggest one that I deal with, I believe, is probably fear. Um, so when dogs are encountering a scary situation um, or very specific triggers, maybe a dog or a person, mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of fear barking. And I I, I love fear barking, one, because it's a really good warning for us um, as the people to, okay, what are you nervous of and how can I change the situation? But it's probably one of the easiest ones to recognize. Um, your dog, normally when we're having that sort of fear response, their body language looks a lot different. Um, so their body may be primarily backwards, but their neck is nice, long, and stretched out. And their mm -hmm. mouth tend to have to have more of like an O shape. And mm -hmm. it's like, woo, woo, woo you know, sort of bark instead of like a, a chappy and like a, a yappy rah, rah, bark. Um, and those are usually warning signs for us. Um, those are not invitations for us to, oh, let me be your friend and let me make it up to you or anything like that. Let me help you feel better. It, those are warning signs to us that our dogs are nervous and they're giving us that insight to how they're feeling inside. And if we don't um, understand those, those warnings that they're giving us, that that fear response might change to something a little bit more serious. Um, but whenever you have your dog experiencing those, you know, it's, it's important for us to consider the factors and the triggers that are going around there. Um, another one, of course, is excitement. Um, and that's usually something like someone's coming at the door and I'm very excited about seeing them. Um, so their body language might look a little bit more happy and prancy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they might be having a wiggle butt or kind of just jumping up with some paws up off of the air. So excitement's definitely another one. Um, another one of my favorites is attention seeking barking. Um, whether they're trying to get your attention, hey, play with me, play with me, play with me, demand barking, things like that. Give me that food, give me that treat, you're taking too long, give me the toy. Um, and we're 
accidentally reinforcing demand barking all the time mm-hmm. so when you're trying to recorrect or redirect that. Um, and so I think those are probably the, the top three biggest reasons why I normally see barking is overexcitement, fear, and demand barking. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like to really understand, you know, which one of those that might be, it just takes a lot of careful observation and knowing your dog and kind of connecting yeah. the dots on the situations in which they are bark- barking. Yeah. Um, Cool. Awesome. So in the original article that you wrote for us, um, you talked about six techniques that dog owners can use. And uh, I was just going to go through some questions about each of those techniques and I'll share the article in the, uh, in the comments later. Um, But so first off, what can you tell us the difference between an an incompatible behavior and a hush cue and is one better than the other to use in your opinion? Yeah. So some trainers will teach a hush cue, um, but in order to get my dog to hush, I have to get my dog to bark in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that that process would go is I make some sort of noise or trigger my dog to bark. And then when my dog is barking, I tell them hush or shush or whatever cue you want to use and then try to find some way to make them stop barking. Some people will put treats in their nose. Mm -hmm. Um, Treats trump the desire to bark. Um, whenever we keep asking for behaviors though, and then of course, since the next thing that follows up is a treat in my nose, even though in this process, we're using the treat to prompt the quietness, the treat presented itself right after the bark. So in Mm -hmm. some capacity, we're rewarding the barking. When we reward behaviors and we start to put a positive reinforcement history behind a behavior, those behaviors happen more often. So Mm -hmm. what you might find is that your dog will start to bark and then look at you. Hey, where's my treat coming? (laughs) a little bit different. So that's teaching a hush cue. An incompatible behavior is in a nutshell, if my dog is doing something I don't want them to be doing, what behavior can I train for them to do instead? So mm-hmm. it'd be it can't do at the same time as the undesired behavior. Mm-hmm. If the dog is running at the front door barking, maybe the better option is for us to teach them a place bed cue. Ding dong, when the doorbell rings, let's go to your place bed instead. And now this is your job instead of barking at the door. Um, if my dog is running along along the fence line and fence fighting with the dog next door, what can I have my dog do differently? Maybe come to me, sit at my feet, and then we go inside. So teaching a different behavior that mm-hmm. does accidentally allow for us to be reinforcing the inappropriate behavior that we're trying to get rid of in the first place. Awesome. And it sounds like, you know, going the hush cue route, I, f- I feel like that would add just like an extra layer of work to do in training your dog too, you know, and it might backfire. It sounds like. Yeah. Um, I pretend it's a little backfire. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Um, Okay. So number two, how can managing your dog's triggers help prevent barking? So I heard you saying, especially with fear, like that can definitely trigger for your dog. Yeah, there's so it's always one identifying the triggers. What are the triggers that are making your dog bark? Um, and then whenever we're talking about behavior modification, we're so let me talk about the difference between basic manners and behavior modification. Basic manners, I'm teaching a dog how to sit, how to down, how to roll over, you know, the, the cute fun stuff. Behavior modification is I have a behavior that I don't want. And now I'm trying to modify how it's presented in my dog's repertoire of behaviors. So when our dog is over or overly barking, that's a behavior that we're trying to change. So in behavior mm-hmm. modification, one, we have to teach what would I rather you do instead? Mm-hmm talked about. But the other part, the other side of that coin is making sure that I'm finding a way to manage the opportunities my dog has to practice those inappropriate behaviors. Because anytime that your dog practices an inappropriate behavior, there's some sort of level of reinforcement there, whether or not it's being delivered by you. So Mm -hmm. to example, the dog that barks at the window every time a stranger passes by, right? We've all, we've all seen those memes of like, you know, the mighty dog, like I just protected my family. (laughs) or whatever, you know, like the, your dog has found a job to do, um, mm-hmm. job that you gave them, but it's a job that they found to do. And when that person's passing by and your dog is barking and barking, when that person ends up going away, in reality had nothing to do with what, what your dog was doing, but in your dog's perception, th- that uh, desired consequence happened because I barked and they went away. So there's always some sort of level of reinforcement there, which is what drives behavior to continue. Mm-hmm. So whenever we have situations like that, we have to find ways to manage the opportunities for my dog to practice the inappropriate behaviors when I'm not available to work and train my dog through those things. So in that instance, it'd be something like, okay, you no longer have access to the window, which is 
easier said than done, right? Everyone always has a couple of different management techniques that don't work for them, but closing blinds, um, putting furniture in front of their, um, blocking off the room with the baby gate or closing the door to that room or kenneling or crating your dog so they don't have the opportunity to practice that. Um, just mm -hmm. it, it helps us drive down that reinforcement rate while we try to build up the reinforcement rate of that incompatible behavior that we want instead. Gotcha. Yeah, that's one trick I do often is just closing the blinds so I don't have to yeah, you know, you have her had that opportunity to bark at strangers when you're walking by. That goes in line with, um, I think, one of the questions that we had from a reader um, was, yes, how do I get my dog to stop barking at people? Um, I didn't have a lot of context for that question. So it mm -hmm. could be, you know, people out and about or people, you know, walking by, I think, at, yeah. you know, at the window. I think that's a common thing. Um, how is, you know, how is... Um, you know, a dog barking at people walking by is different than when, you know, you're sitting out at a cafe or something with your dog and, and they happen to bark at somebody walking by. How is that different? Um, I honestly don't think they're that, that they are that different. Um, mm -hmm. Scenarios is usually some sort of barrier. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're at the window, right? there's a barrier of the window in front of me um, mm -hmm. or I'm nervous and I'm triggered because I see something that I'm uncomfortable with. That's, you know, I'm encroaching on my space. I bark or the other option is, Oh my God, there's a person, there's a dog. I really want to go say hi to them, but I can't because this barrier is here. Right. So that's mm -hmm. frustration. Um, some dogs do that like at dog parks and, and situations, or like you said, kind of like sitting down at a patio where as long as you're inside the gate and my corral of whatever we're in, like you're cool. Like I don't, I won't bark at you, but as soon as you're on the opposite side of the fence, mm -hmm. now, for whatever reason, things, barriers, like fences, windows, um, those are, um, front sided barriers right there in front, but the leash also creates a barrier. Mm -hmm. as well. It's a lot less, people don't really consider it a barrier because it's on a front, right? It's usually more on their back or, you know, your backwards holding them from the back. Um, but that's still a barrier because now your dog can't go say hi to that person or go say hi to that dog. Or if it's out of a fear element, maybe your dog feels like, oh my gosh, I can't run away because I'm tough. Mm. Right. Um, and so I don't think that they're that different. The situations are different. Yes. But I still feel like the underlying conditioned emotional response, which is always a mouthful. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> still the same, and that's why we still get the triggers for those. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, okay. Uh, I think you've touched on this a little bit already, but how do dog owners unknowingly uh, reinforce their dogs barking? Yeah. So <laughs> I think there's also another meme that says like, when I bark at the window and tell the strangers to go away, my people bark with me, right? <laughs> uh, so when we yell at our dog, um, hey, mm -hmm. stop, you know, especially if they're barking at something that's outside, um, we're just adding to that energy. And mm -hmm. the fact that we're giving in that moment is not conducive. It's not effective for our dogs, um, especially because when our dogs are already red zoned and in the moment of barking, hardly mm -hmm penetrating these ear holes. So, um, you know, that's one way that we accidentally give, give more energy into the situation. Um, but I think the biggest one that I see is, um, especially in, in terms of demand barking, right? So if you're sitting down watching TV, you've had a long day and your dog comes and they're trying to, you know, ask for your attention, they're pawing at you, they're doing things like that. Um, you're trying to ignore them because you don't really want to pay attention to them. You're tired. And then they go, bah! and they bark right in your face. <laughs> Usually the biggest response that dogs will get is, what are you doing? Oh, my God. You know, they get a really big response out of us. Mm -hmm. All that they wanted in that moment was our attention. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what we're doing is we're either giving too much energy with the wrong ineffective feedback or we are accidentally reinforcing our dogs by giving us by giving them that attention. Mm -hmm. in our mind, we're thinking, but I'm getting mad at you like you shouldn't want that attention but our dogs are amazing and they love us no matter what's happening. So they're just so excited that they're getting our attention, especially <laughs> on the day of, you know, work, you being at school. And so what they're finding out is, oh, doing X, Y, Z, things like barking always gets my people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we start to go through that process, um, one of the questions that I ask my clients is, well, how long has this been behavior been going on? Because if it's a brand new behavior that your dog is just trying out, it's easy to break. But mm -hmm. it's 
that your dog has been practicing for a long time and you've accidentally built that reward history behind the bark for a long time, then we have this area where your dog doesn't just give up on things very easily, right? Your, our dogs are pretty tenacious, especially when it comes to things that have always brought them reinforcements. So um, the behavior tends to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden one day you decide to no longer, okay, I'm really gonna pay attention. I'm really gonna make sure that I don't give my dog any sort of attention when they're barking at me your dog becomes a little bit frustrated because why aren't you giving me your attention? This always, mm -hmm. always works. What's going on? Um, I, I call it like the soda machine effect. When you go up to the soda machine, you put your dollar and you expect your Coke to come out. And when it doesn't, you don't just, oh, okay, I guess I'm never going to put another <laughs> soda machine. You buttons, you, right, you're, you're expecting a certain consequence to your behavior. When that doesn't happen, you try to figure out why it's not working. So when that build up and that climax of your dog trying to figure out why it's not working also builds your frustration. So mm -hmm. now you're barking because they wanted your attention. Now they're barking even longer and harder because they're frustrated, which frustrates you. And then if you do the uh, stop and you like just once again, you just give in your dog's like, oh, goody, it still works. I just <laughs> I just have to hi, Mariah Carey note and then they'll go ahead and give me that. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely I think that's that's probably one of the 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 biggest mistakes that we make when it comes to barking and especially the demand barking aspect is, mm -hmm. um, you know, not being considerate and careful because any attention that we give our dog for them, they love it and they're going to eat it up. <laughs> so in that situation, is it best to just like not look at them, not say anything, or is just getting up and walking to a different room an yeah. option if it's really hard to to not respond? Yeah, both of those for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, it depends on your day too. Um, mm -hmm. People like if you have if you're working through this with your dog, be very honest with yourself when you come home. If you're okay, like I, I I had a great day, like I'm ready to work and I can practice this and I can really make sure that I'm giving my dog attention when they're being doing things that I want them to do and make sure that I'm not going to get frustrated and I'm going to work through not giving them attention during the undi und undesired behavior, that's easier. But if you've had a long day, you know that you're not in the mood, one, manage the situation. Um, and I tell people, like, don't placate your dog. Don't wait for your dog to start throwing a tantrum before placating or babysitting. Mm -hmm. I usually do with things like that is find things for your dog to do. So here's the bully stick. Here's the frozen Kong. Here's whatever to keep you busy. Don't wait for your dog to start barking and then give them that. Cause that's a mm. sure way for your dog to realize when I become a pest, they bring me gifts. Right. Gotcha. So instead bring out all of those things for your dog beforehand to keep them entertained, prevent your dog from doing that behavior so that we don't have to deal with it. Um, so it's just, you know, it's about having the honest conversation with yourself when you get home and figuring out one, am I willing to do the work? or two, am I not having a good day or I know that I'm not going to be able to give effective feedback in this situation and mm -hmm. then thing from there for the day. Those are good tips. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it sounds like a lot of part of the managing your dog sparking. So managing the situation before it happens kind of thing. Um, what are some of the best ways to desensitize your dog from the things that make them bark? Watering down the trigger is, and finding ways to do that sometimes can be difficult. Um, so say, for example, if your dog is triggered by the sound of other dog noises, um, mm -hmm. maybe find some YouTube videos or clips of mm -hmm. dogs barking in the background, turning the volume down really low. And then depending on what's going on, if your dog is excited about that, then maybe we reward your dog for choices to become relaxed. Mm -hmm. If nervous by that well now we're going to pair that audio with fun things whether we're here's now we're going to have a really crazy play session and play your favorite your dog's favorite tug of war game or we're going to be giving lots of um treats or we're going to be giving our dogs regular meals but zhuzhing it up in some sort of special way while that audio plays i think that's a good one um and then with time you start to increase the intensity of the trigger itself mm -hmm. um Another one that we do is like doorbell sounds, right? Um, our dogs, a lot of dogs are really triggered by doorbells because usually that is the pre, uh, the precursor to the magical portal opening <laughs> the other side, something that either causes me great excitement or something that causes me great anxiety. Mm -hmm. So when we can start to have those triggers, the doorbell or knocking, over and over and over and over and over again. And the consequence isn't the magical portal opening and bringing something exciting or scary on the other side, your dogs will start, soon start to realize that it's not worth for me to give my energy to that because most more often than not, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. 
that one's really hard for us to do because that one already for most dogs already has a really good association to what's going on, especially for older dogs who've been experiencing it for some time. So we have to do it. And I, I mean, like hundreds, thousands, like they have to hear the sound hundreds, thousands of times and not mm -hmm. that consequence happen for you to start to wean off of that association. Um, and then of course, what actually happens is, yeah, the doorbell does make the magical portal open, right? And so sometimes those things still do happen. Um, so there's always a level of like, we're never going to be able to completely change and completely desensitize, but we at least want to water down that trigger a little bit more. Um, whenever we're talking about like leash reactivity, if your dog barks at people or dogs on leash, there's usually something called a critical distance. Mm -hmm. Can we be to the trigger before my dog starts to bark and go into reactivity? So in our reactivity lessons, what we do is we put the trigger into a safe distance to where your dog can see it but not already be triggered enough to where, okay, I can see it and not bark. I can see it and not bark. And then with time, mm -hmm. we close up that critical distance. Gotcha. So finding ways to water down the trigger can sometimes be a little bit tricky, um, but there's usually always some sort of way for us to do that, whether it's um, the intensity of the sound or even just distance or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, Carrie asked, uh, what if the trigger is the children in the home? So it sounds like, you know, the children of the family at home. Yeah. Um, do you see no. that often? How do you address that? I don't see it often, but we definitely have worked through a couple of those. Um, that one is pretty tricky um, because I, I definitely wouldn't want to talk about what are the management techniques that we're putting into place. Um, I'm guessing if m most of the time dogs are nervous of children versus excited for children. And so unless Carrie's here and can kind of give us more information on, on that, I'm going to guess that we're nervous. Um, so there's a lot of more management than you would think. It's not only making sure that, you know, the dogs and the children aren't together without some sort of parental supervision, but even when they are together, like, okay, the kids have to be nice and calm and quiet while the dog's over here to continue to build that positive association, which is really hard for kids to do, especially super young children because mm -hmm. they energy themselves and they want to run around and they cry and they're loud and they make sudden movements and all those things are scary for dogs. Um, but to find ways to always have whatever interactions they do have be a positive one, especially for the dog um, and to not overdo it sometimes. I think mm -hmm. Whenever we're having things like children and dogs, we want the process to go by so quickly because it's really important for us, for our family to be in harmony and to live together. But when we push and rush that process, that can also build frustration. So now that anxiety and that fear is now paired with frustration, and that's not a good combo. Um, mm -hmm. Doing things like, okay, let's have, let's, this is usually a good option. So like going out for a walk with the kids, right? Um, Whenever I'm meeting a new dog and walking to a client's home for the first time and they're nervous of strangers, I say, meet me outside. Let's go for a walk. Um, that's usually a really great bonding activity for introducing dogs together also. And I think for a mm -hmm. couple of reasons, number one, it's outdoors and it's fun and exciting. But two, there's a level of distraction there. So mm -hmm. I have to feel like the scary spiders center focus because there's all these other things going on. And now I'm not only focused on the scary spider in this situation, the children, um, because now I have all these other things to smell as well. And because most dogs love walks, it's a nice positive association between the two. Um, so one, making sure that any interaction that they have is nice and short and ends on a positive note. And then there's lots of management techniques involved. So crate training, um, you know, having the, the kids be in one side of the house while the dogs are on the other. And I would say frequent and short and sweet interactions with them would probably be what, slow and steady wins the race. So that's going to mm -hmm. drive your progress faster than, okay, let's hunker down and I'll watch a movie and I'm going to hold the dog here and the dog. <laughs> you know? So that might be a little bit of a different way to hit that. Okay. Yeah. Carrie followed up and she said, yes, our pup seems nervous. Our new schnauzer pup is five months old and he seems to be nervous when my seven-year-old wants to play with him. So yeah, yeah. sounds yeah. like you hit the nail on the head with yeah. the nervous. I, I love schnauzers. I have two myself. Um, yeah. I think lots of management, lots of fun play times for, for them together. Um, and just, you know, taking it, taking it one day at a time. Natural calming remedies, actually, that's what I was going to say. Natural calming remedies would be a great thing for you to maybe work into your dog's um, supplements. Um, things like CBD treats. Um, one of my favorite people with having your dog take something like injection. 
a DAP collar, D-A-P, dog appeasing pheromone. Um, the brand that I like the most is called Adaptil, A-D-A-P-T-I-L. Um, we sell them here in our boutique. But they look like an old school collar. They wear it for a month. It has pheromones that are really similar to the ones that moms give off when they're nursing. So it has like a nice oxytocin, like mm -hmm. hormone, and it helps reduce anxieties to further progress training. Um, so for your dog, Carrie, being five months, you have a lot of really good things going on for you. It's not like you have a six-year-old um, dog who's had trauma with children. Um, I would just talk to maybe about your kids about how we can be more calm around the puppy, um, building a positive association for your puppy towards the children, um, and maybe consider working in a couple of those natural anxiety remedies as well, just to help further your progress. Awesome. Good tips. Um, and good to know we can get that at the boutique. Yeah. Um, okay. How can practicing settling skills help with your dog's barking? Yeah. So if, if we're going, if we're talking about dogs who bark because they're overexcited, calming techniques are really good. And um, if you think about it, when we're dog training, we're always asking our dogs to do something, right? Do something so I can give you a treat. So whenever we're doing a lot of that training, we're not teaching our dog one to think critically and make your own decisions. And two, doing nothing also has a reward value, right? We don't teach them that. Mm -hmm. So when our dogs are keen and they pick up on things like I do things to get treats, I do things and get reactions out of my people. We sometimes create a dog that's just like, I got to be doing things. Where's my next job? Right. <laughs> Finding things like teaching our dog to find value and importance in the skill of calming down is really important also. So if you think you have a dog like that, I'd like to run my clients through a conditioned relaxation exercise. You first start it off at home when there's no distraction. You slowly start to work up your level of distraction. Um, but it looks super boring and it looks super easy. So you might be thinking like, man, I'm not doing anything. But that's the whole point. So grab your leash, sit down with your kiddo, um, grab some treats, but don't let it be in like a crinkly wrinkly bag, put them in your pockets, put them in a treat pouch, something that's quiet. And literally just wait for your dog one to make their own decision. And two, to quiet, calm down. So we're not telling our dogs sit, we're not telling our dogs down, leave it anything like that. We're literally just waiting. Your dog might be looking at you like, hey, man, I'm going to get the treats where the treats where the treats and you're just waiting for your dog to maybe go from a stand to a sit. If they sit nice and quietly, give them a cookie. If they're sitting and they decide to, okay, I'm going to lay down, okay, give them a cookie. If they decide to lay their head down, okay, give them a cookie. So you're making, you're treating them for one, making their own own choices to two, calm themselves down. Mm -hmm. Now, if your dog goes the opposite way, if they go from like napping to like, okay, where's my cookie? Uh, we just ignore it. So we're not adding anything to the situation for that. We're not telling them, no, don't do that. We're just ignoring that decision. Um, so once your dog starts to calm quicker and for longer periods of time, then you start working up the distraction level. So maybe you start doing it in the backyard or in the front yard, or maybe you take it to a park and maybe you do it when a friend comes over. Um, and so that can also then help your dog generalize to I'm finding quiet and making that decision in other situations and choosing to ignore the external stimuli that normally gets me excited and causes me to bark. Awesome. Good. Um, I have one more question and somebody popped up with one. Can you give some tips for dogs who get too excited and start barking at other dogs in the same house during play? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I think that also kind of depends on a little bit of what's happening. Um, is it like police dog barking? So like in daycare, if we have two dogs playing, and one dog comes and barks at them. Sometimes this dog is telling them like, hey man, I don't like your energy, stop it. Mm -hmm. one, you're, that's not your choice to make, so I'm gonna step in for you. Um, some dogs, it's a frustration bark. Like, hey, I wanna, like I was playing with that dog and now I wanna play back with them. Um, so that's also just another redirection. Like, hey man, I'm sorry, like that dog found another playmate for the moment and you're just gonna have to. <laughs> um, sometimes it's the way that they initiate to bark, uh, or excuse me, to play. And sometimes that's accidentally reinforced by the other dog. So some dogs will do really well at ignoring the dog barking and that you would think would drive down, you know, the um, the reinforcement right there. But every once in a while, that same dog then reciprocates that play. Thus, mm. 
reinforcing that that behavior. Um, so it, it kind of just depends. But what I would say, if that's something that you don't want to happen, um, let your dogs enjoy their session. But when the barking starts to happen, we calm all parties down. Um, so maybe physically step in, ask for a sit. I probably wouldn't bring treats out into the situation because I don't want your dogs to learn. I bark, I sit, I get treats. Um, but having them sit, having them quiet for three to five seconds, and then letting them go back and playing. Um, so basically what ends up happening is we are riding a level kind of more down here where your dog gets a little bit excited, but you help them calm down and kind of riding more of a smooth wave versus your dog getting excited, getting really excited, and now getting all the way up here at the top. Now I'm barking, now I'm overexcited, and now I have to really bring my dog really far down. So mm -hmm. oftentimes when we step in and help our dogs take small, frequent breaks, their their play is doesn't escalate as quickly or as far. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a good tip, and it helps you to to key in on on their energy level a little bit sooner yeah. before it does get out of hand. Um, all right, what should you do when your dog doesn't bark when they might usually do so? Yeah, tell us about that. Be very thankful. <laughs> <laughs> so reinforcing that, right? It sounds like you know that kind of feeds into some of the other things you've talked about, but that was one tip that you gave. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, a lot of times, I, not a lot of times, I have, I have had some people that come and be like, my dog doesn't bark. And I'm like, I'm like <laughs> I, all my other clients are trying to get not barking. Um, so yeah, sometimes we just have quiet dogs and that's, and that's totally fine. Um, some dogs will find their voice and then you're going to wish that they hadn't. Um, those are small anomalies in my mm -hmm. opinion, so. I think I think in the original article, this is more of when your dog usually is a big barker, and then all of a sudden, it sounds like this would be a situation where the like the not barking starts to you, sink in I, a little bit more. So yeah, got it. Okay, yeah, girl, I, I don't know how long I wrote that article. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really praising that. Um, mm -hmm. so making sure that we don't waste that opportunity to tell our dogs, "Oh my God, like what you did was amazing. I'm, I'm so proud of you for that." Um, giving our positive feedback when our dogs are making the right choices are so much more important mm -hmm. than us not giving feedback or us correcting the inappropriate behavior. Um, so when we can find moments to have that positive association, that positive reinforcement, that's really what's going to drive behavior instead of just redirecting it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I've just added the link to the original article in the comments for anyone who wants to go over there and find it. Um, if you're watching this afterwards, you can go to the dogguideessay.com to read more about these tips that we discussed here today. Um, a huge thank you to Stephanie. Um, be sure to go check out Pup Up and Away um, on Instagram, their website. Um, and also we mentioned earlier that they are a current Paw Pass partner. Um, and you can get 20% off um, boutique purchases right now and 10% off a boarding say, stay. So you mentioned some good, uh, uh, you, that collar that you mentioned, you guys, you said that you have in the store. So if you were uh, keen on checking that out, um, go swing by their boutique. Um, and you can learn more about the Paw Pass on our website if you haven't already ha purchased one. Um, and then tune in for our next Trainer Tip Tuesday. Right now, we're going to do this monthly. Um, so our next one will be on October 19th. And we'll get another Facebook event and reminder up there for you guys. So you can be sure to tune in. Um, you can go back and watch this video if you only caught part of it. Um, and thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you, Stephanie, for being a great resource for us all. Sounds like we had some really great uh, feedback from our viewers today. So see you Good. guys next time. Thank you so much.